Welcome to everyone who's joined us. That's Alex here. Let me get my camera on for a second. Um, I think I'm just going to give it a few more seconds so that everyone who is joining in through the through waiting room gets into our our main group into the call. All right, let's get started. We only have one hour. There's a lot to get through. Um, so my name is Alex Benkenstein. Um, I think many of you might know me by now. I head up the Climate Change and Natural Resources Program at SIA. Thank you so much for joining us. We are days away from the kickoff of COP28, and thought it was an opportune time uh, to share some of the the context issues uh, that we're um, seeing coming through various engagements, policy forums that we're engaging in, um, and also share some results uh, and messages emerging from our research. Uh, we'd initially thought about framing this as specifically a media briefing, but felt it made sense actually to open it up to our broader um, SIA membership. So, if you are a member of uh, the media, uh, also very welcome to you. Um, the one important thing I would say is that obviously there's a lot that we're going to cover today, probably a lot of information that's going to come through in the next hour or so. Um, but we really do encourage you also to reach out to us um, for follow-up interviews. And the easiest way to do that is to reach us through our uh, media email address, it's simply media at SIA, S -A -I -I -A, dot org, dot Z -A. And perhaps one of our media team, our internal uh, communications team, could just put that uh, email address in the chat for us. All right, very good. So the way we're going to approach today is I'm going to um, go over some, some remarks. Um, rather than uh, what we've we've done in previous years, which is have submissions from various uh, research uh, researchers or research heads from the program, uh, we're going to try and simplify the structure a bit this year. So I will make an initial intervention, and then we're going to open up for questions. But as we engage with those questions, we do have members of this broader SIA team part of this conversation here today. They may assist me in responding to those questions and they may jump in with, with any points that they think needs further emphasis or perhaps something that I've, I've missed in my initial remarks. So with that said, um, I think it's best for me to kick us off. Um, what I would also ask, uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, my colleague Jordan, if you could just put the links to uh, two publications uh, that have come out very recently from SIA, a policy briefing on COP28 itself, and then a very useful document on key African countries to watch at COP28, which also gives a very useful overview of some of the key negotiating structures um, for the Africa region when it comes to global climate negotiations. So if you could put those two publication links in the chat for me, and also just the general link to our climate publications, our climate thematic area, um, where all the research that SIA does on uh, climate uh, is easily accessible through, through one link. So um, COP28, it's I think useful to pause and remind ourselves why COP is important. Um, look, the, the Conference of the Parties, COP, process of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it remains the most important mechanism through which countries come together to coordinate a response to climate change. Um, we are very aware that COP fatigue is a real thing. It's growing. Many people, organizations, even countries are voicing frustration and disillusionment with the COP process. Um, it's not a perfect process by any means. Uh, but I do think that we've got to focus on strengthening this process uh, as best we can. 
the reality of any multilateral process is that it can only move as fast and it can only be as ambitious as the countries participating in that process allow it to be. But all actors, uh, you know, think tanks like SIA, advocacy organizations, business, local government, uh, youth, all play a part, uh, not only in creating pressure for our states to be more ambitious in their climate response, but also in our own domains, developing and, and implementing solutions. There is one point that I think is really important to address, and that's the question of the relationship between climate change and development. Uh, and there's a narrative out there that presents climate change and development as a trade-off. So if, we, if we're gonna prevent climate change, that means that we're gonna have to sacrifice, on the other hand, socioeconomic progress, jobs and growth. Uh, South Africa and Africa broadly, and, and even the global South uh, obviously faces significant economic challenges, unemployment, extreme and growing inequality, limited access to electricity, limited economic opportunities. And, and so if, if this trade-off mindset is our starting point, then, then of course there's going to be pushback. Uh, at its most extreme, this is, is presented as a, as a sort of sinister and cynical push by those parts of our society and those countries in the global economy that are already wealthy to prevent the poor from gaining access to prosperity. So, so this is the, presented as the wealthy kicking away the ladder and suggesting that we institutionalize poverty and underdevelopment as some sort of strategy to combat climate change. Um, now, that's certainly not the way I think about this area, though there are some, some points to raise, but I want to bring this across as a narrative that's out there that we need to engage with. And, and I do think we must be clear about a few things. Um, climate change itself is one of the most dire threats to development that we confront. Poor countries, poor sectors of our society are the most vulnerable to climate impacts. And in part, that's because they have the least resources to protect themselves um, from its impacts. It's, it's true that Africa has contributed a very small share of carbon emissions. So in that sense, Africa and other developing regions have not caused this problem. But unfortunately, that does not mean that we can exempt ourselves from uh, the responsibility to help resolve it. It does, however, mean that we should insist on ambitious action and meaningful support from those countries that contributed most to historical emissions. These are the most developed countries, the global north. Uh, it means that we must continue to emphasize that any transition must be a just transition and, and recognize also that this idea of a just transition plays out at multiple levels, at community level, industry level, country level, regionally and globally multiple dimensions and levels of analysis that are relevant here. It also means that we cannot focus only on mitigating emissions to prevent climate change. Of course, we do need to do that, but there has to be a balance also in our focus on adapting to climate change that is happening already and will continue to accelerate uh, in order to reduce the harm that climate change does. And we need to support the loss and damage that occurs despite our best efforts to reduce such harm, especially in those countries that have the least resources to address this themselves, which typically are also those countries that have contributed least to climate change. So to pause a second and reflect on the broader context uh, in which COP28 takes place this year. Um, I think we're all aware that this is a period of heightened geopolitical volatility, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, we have a Republican controlled Congress in the US. We have economic headwinds in China. Uh, we've got ongoing diplomatic and financial ramifications of the war in, in Ukraine. And all of these have, 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 shall we say, dampened the expectation of, of what can be achieved at COP28. But, we are also seeing some positive developments that make us a bit more optimistic. Um, one of the big sticking points has been negotiation, negotiations around the loss and damage fund. And we did have an agreement, even though this wasn't the outcome that the Global South wanted, they were willing to concede this point and agree that the loss and damage fund would be positioned within the World Bank or hosted by the World Bank. Um, now, again, this wasn't something that developing countries or the Global South wanted, 
but it was a point that they were going to concede, were willing to concede so that we didn't go into COP28 without at least agreeing the basic parameters of the loss and damage fund. And this now creates the space for um, actual contributions. You know, there was a lot of excitement about the announcement of the loss and damage fund itself last year, COP27. But very quickly, people started pointing out that what we basically have is an agreement to establish a fund, but without any financial commitments to the fund. It's just a hollow shell at that point. Now, with the negotiations that have taken place over this year, with, uh, amongst others, the agreement on how this fund will be hosted, that now creates the space for real uh, commitments to be made, financial commitments to be, to be made uh, towards contributions to this fund. And we've already seen um, the EU, for example, signaling that they are ready to make some, some big announcements at COP28 in this regard. So that's important. Um, China and the US, the two world's largest carbon emitters, uh, have agreed um, recently to work more closely on combating climate change. Uh, we've seen a, a series of major multilateral forums, for example, the G20 summit this year, including commitments to address climate change and facilitate a just energy transition. Um, and we've seen the United Arab Emirates uh, which is leading COP28 and hosting COP28 this year, set out uh, an ambitious set of objectives that are actually quite aligned with, with some of the key points that the Africa region has, has prioritized. That's points like fast-tracking a just and equitable energy transition, um, addressing climate finance, uh, addressing or supporting uh, nature-based solutions, lives and livelihoods, um, and, and very importantly, to promote a very inclusive COP process. Uh, another important part of the uh, context that we're heading into here is that we've had a year where um, Africa as a region has, has really upped its game in, in terms of setting out the framework and messaging of what it needs. Now, the Africa group of negotiators has always been a very active group in the COP negotiations and has had fairly consistent messaging over the years about the priorities for the continent. But what we had at the beginning of last year was the adoption at the African Union of the Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan. So this is the first formal climate strategy adopted at AU level. And then this year we had uh, the Africa Climate Summit um, the first of its kind major gathering um, in, uh, in Kenya, in Nairobi, and that resulted in the Nairobi Declaration. And perhaps, Romy, you could help me with the link to those two documents in the chat. But these two policy instruments together, the Nairobi uh, Declaration that came out of the Africa Climate Summit and the formal African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan, these two instruments are well aligned and does mean that the Africa region is going into COP28 with a very clear framework and set of priorities and messaging about what the continent wants. So in the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to touch on a few points, a few themes um, uh, that's uh, reflecting in the one part around what we're seeing uh, at a kind of continental level messaging, but also drawing out some messaging uh, from the research itself that SAI is involved in. Um, so climate finance. Uh, Africa has for a long time, as I said, for the Africa group of negotiations has been very consistent about this, increasing the scale and accessibility of climate finance. I think what we're seeing in the Nairobi <clears throat> Declaration and increasingly through other forums uh, that's a little bit different is that these calls for increased uh, scale, so more climate finance and making it easier to get that climate finance to where it is needed most. That's the messaging we've had until now, and that remains extremely important. 
but increasingly we're seeing these calls couched within a wider effort and calls for systemic reform of the global financial system. And I think this shift of looking at the global financial system as a whole and asking what structural issues need to be addressed beyond just the scale and accessibility of the finance, but reforming the system itself. I think this is a, a big change that we're seeing and something that we're going to continue to be seeing from, from, the, from the Africa group. Um, so African countries need to build resilience to the impacts of climate change on their economies, uh, especially with the growing intensity of climate shocks. But this is going to be impossible with the financing gaps that the continent continues to face uh, and, and the push for a new economic playbook that recognizes the needs of African countries and the shortfalls they face under the current global financial architecture will therefore remain a key area of focus at COP28. I've talked about uh, the loss and damage fund. I think for now, I'm not going to um, uh, return to that. I think uh, I've given a, a, a a basic framework about the situation, but this is one of the key issues that we're going to be looking at or that everyone really is going to be looking at at COP28 and what we achieve in relation to the loss and damage fund, I think is going to play a fairly significant part um, by the end of COP28 when we start assessing to what extent uh, this has been a success or not. Um, on energy and the just transition, certainly we need more financing packages such as the Just Energy Transition Partnership that South Africa is engaged in. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing more countries come on board uh, with these sorts of deals, Indonesia, for example, and there's some that have been announced and are being explored in, in the Africa region as well. Um, it's going to be important that the countries embarking on such processes must retain the agency to negotiate the societal compact that is required to actually implement such a transition. So essentially that agency at the country level that this is seen as a solution not imposed by external actors, but that support is offered by external actors to a process that is driven uh, by domestic actors locally and in an inclusive manner. And I know there have been criticisms of the work that the Presidential Climate Commission and other actors have done around the Just Transition Framework and, and the Just Energy Transition Investment Plan. Not arguing here that that's a perfect process, but there have been substantive efforts there to make those processes inclusive and to consult. And I could tell you from engaging with, with other countries and other parts of the world and in Africa, there's a lot of interest in what lessons can be taken from South Africa. Of course, those countries are gonna have their own solutions, their own dynamics, but in terms of setting up the structure and trying to promote inclusivity and trying as best as we can to get to that societal level agreement about what we should prioritize, I think uh, looking at those process lessons, uh, South Africa can be proud of what it's, what it's achieved. Um, on mitigation, we still do need ambitious mitigation efforts, especially from those countries and sectors responsible for, for the most emissions historically. Always we're going to need to focus on the vulnerable, uh, vulnerable countries, vulnerable sectors of our society. Um, uh, that remains a, a framework within that, within that just transition. Um, there's another area which which is fairly controversial. There's no, no way of getting around it. Um, and it's this question of, obviously we know we need to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the mitigation component. Uh, I know many people feel the only way to do that is to get rid of fossil fuels altogether and, and that no good can come from engaging with, with fossil fuel companies. Um, some, and I've you know, I'm mixing here between side positions and just insights emerging from my own personal engagements. But I, I would argue for a more pragmatic approach. Um, the reality is that fossil fuel companies are also going to have to be part of the solution. And that means that we are going to need to engage in discussion around carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, and, and, and some, of, uh, some of these other emerging technologies. It's true that many of these technologies are...
uh, not well developed yet, have not to be proven to be commercially viable at scale. Um, but I do think that we're going to need to continue to explore this and engage with this. And I know there's a lot of sensitivity and there's been a lot of debate around the role of the UAE as an oil producer hosting uh, global climate negotiations. Um, maybe we can discuss that in, <laughs> in the discussion section. So I've already said quite a few things around climate finance. Um, our economic diplomacy team has been doing a, a bit of work in this area and other parts of our institute. Um, Joseph, if you manage to join the group, maybe you can also share the link to uh, the work that, that uh, you've been doing around looking at greening the COVID recovery. Um, and, and this still remains very important um, uh, for, for Africa and other regions. Um, so climate change, green recovery must be integrated into economic recovery plans and growth plans uh, spoken about the need to reform the global financial system um, but that also includes recovery funds during global crises um, african governments have a role to play to facilitate the development of local green finance mechanisms um, by, by establishing or augmenting domestic climate funds capitalizing green finance facilities um, and, and pooling risk um, so there's a, there's a lot of work that can be done. I know the narrative tends to be what the North owes the South or owes Africa in terms of finance and that that finance is not sufficient. Again, I don't, you know, that remains extremely important. We must continue with those efforts. At the same time, I think we must recognize that if you look at the scale of the challenges we face, there's no question that we must mobilize domestic resources as well. That's not to let the global north off the hook when it comes to finance. That's just accepting the reality that we're going to need support from the global north and we're going to need to mobilize domestic resources, financial resources to respond to climate change. Um, I, think, I think that's just a matter of fact, but again, we can discuss these things. Um, on adaptation, um, another key point for this COP is to see further work on the global goal for adaptation. This is something that was agreed to um, a few years ago in the COP process, but a lot of work still needs to be done around indicators, monitoring in the framework, kind of operationalizing, shall we say, the global goal for adaptation. And certainly we'd want to see some progress on that coming out of COP28. Um, another big theme um, and something that we as an institute has also been, been focusing on for the past few years is working on working with nature, so nature-based solutions or ecosystems-based adaptation to climate change. Um, we ourselves have done some work on this, focusing specifically on uh, coastal environments, marine and coastal ecosystems-based adaptation. Uh, Rami, you could help me with the link, or Hannah, if you're on, uh, with the link to, to that work. Um, but broadly, I think increasingly it's recognized that uh, we need to find ways to work with nature, to restore and protect nature, and that that is not only a good in itself, but that that actually also provides socioeconomic benefits to countries and communities around those ecosystems, and it provides climate benefits. It helps protect coastal communities and other communities against the impacts of climate change. It remains a very important part of our adaptation response. There's a lot of adaptation and mitigation technologies and response measures that already exist, um, but often it's the political, economic, and financial enablers that are missing, and, and that's where we really need to Put our focus as i said and the global goal for adaptation remains a priority and africa is going to continue pushing for that another big issue it's it's a little conciliatory it's not really negotiated as such um through the cop process but in this discussion about transitioning 
towards renewable energies and the need for a massive ramping up scaling of renewable energy technologies. We also recognize, of course, that while they use the sun and the wind, uh, the infrastructure itself, the solar panels, the wind turbines, the batteries for electric vehicles or for storage of power in a, in a, in a solar system, those batteries, those things are physical infrastructure. They need to be built and they require metals and minerals. Um, so this question of critical minerals or transition minerals uh, in the African context, they're often referred to as green minerals, um, but broadly, the most common term, critical minerals, these are things like lithium, cobalt, graphite. Um, there's no question that there's going to be a massive ramp up of demand for these minerals. At the moment, a lot of the manufacturing of this green technology is happening in China. The EU, the US has already signaled through policy measures that they want more of this manufacturing to be happening domestically, not to cut China off entirely, but not to be as reliant as they currently are. It's upwards of like upwards of 80% of, of, of batteries and, and solar panels, for example, are manufactured at the moment in China. So in this context, and the fact that a lot of these minerals are in Africa, um, then the question remains, does Africa just get locked in uh, as the source of these critical minerals that then gets processed and the value addition and the links to industry happens elsewhere. Well, uh, you know, the continent has, has clearly signaled that they're not satisfied with that status quo uh, and they want to change that picture. There is an African green mineral strategy that is under development uh, by a process led through the African Development Bank. There is an earlier position paper that is available online Adrian, if you're on the call, you could maybe find the link to that uh, position paper. It's not a SIA document, but it is available online and we could help you with that. Um, so I think the critical minerals theme, there's a lot of work that SIA has been doing. Again, Adrian or one of my colleagues can put links to the SIA work on critical minerals. We're working with the African Union Commission okay. and other partners on this. So uh, while this isn't maybe a primary theme in terms of the COP discussions, it is very part, very much part of the bigger discussion on just transition and climate responses. And well, we wanted to use the opportunity to at least make you aware of the work that SAI is doing in this area and invite you to engage with us on that. And let me also say, this is not just for the journalists uh, in the room. Uh, SAI, you know, is, tries to be as, as open and engaging as possible. So if, if you come across any research on the SIA website or you have questions for us, reach out to us. Contact details are on the website. Um, the last theme I wanted to touch, and I see it's nicely going into about half time here, um, is, is inclusivity. Um, now, this has always been a priority theme for, um, for Africa. Um, to insist that these processes are inclusive, that there's a sense of agency. Um, climate responses are going to have impacts on, on all sectors of society and across the globe. And it's important that those that are affected by both the challenge of climate change, but also those that are affected uh, in the ways that by, by our response to climate change. And again, this is where the just transition ties in you know, that they're part of the conversation, that they have agency. Uh, there's a lot of dimensions to that. Um, the gender dimension, they are kind of global dynamics of North and South, um, societal dynamics. And a big theme here is youth. Uh, and not that youth are included in some sort of tokenistic instrumental way, that we have this big discussion and we, we make a little bit of time for for youth to do their thing in a corner, but that they are fundamentally involved and that their agency is recognized in, in leading and in shaping climate change responses, remembering that it is our youth and future generations that are actually going to be bearing the brunt of um, the, the harm that is done if we fail to act today. Um, and they have to therefore be part, um, meaningful part of 
of the discussion and part of the solutions. And that's very important. SAI has a long history of youth engagement and facilitating youth youth engagement. As I said, not, not engaging on behalf of youth, but empowering and facilitating youth engagement in a variety of policy processes. Um, and uh, again, some of my colleagues might put up some relevant links. Um, there's uh, the uh, the youth statement, um, uh, the, the exact, uh, precise wording of it escapes me now, but the youth statement that SIA and uh, a number of youth across the country through the Youth Policy Committee have been working on shaping. And there's been projects at multiple levels, you know, community level, city level, and also youth engagement that SIA has been able to facilitate um, in the COP processes itself, and we we will we will again have some young people from the from the SIA family, shall we say, um, participating in in COP twenty eight. So we're about halfway through the hour. I do want to allow time for engagement and discussion. Uh, as I've been going, you would have heard me a number of times asking my colleagues to put up links in the chat. Um, I hope they've managed to do that. Um, and I'm also going to ask my colleague Romy to help me keep an eye on hands going up because I'm for some reason not very good at that. Yep. Just change my view here to gallery. And um, at some point, I will probably ask my, my colleagues to also jump in um, from, from youth and Romy, who's, who's in fact our climate lead, and a few other colleagues. But I think let's first see if we have some, some questions from the group. You can just, um, easiest would be to just put a, put a virtual hand up for us. So Alex, just in the meantime, there is one um, comment or question from uh, Gwen Foster around the global stock tech. So Gwen, maybe you wanna um, and Mike can maybe ask Alex that um, and I can always jump in. Well, I'll, I'll just quickly jump in on the global stock take it, it, and I realize it's it's something that that comes up a lot um, and that I haven't actually addressed it. You know, it is a priority for COP28. This COP28 is is the moment where the results of the global stock take um, uh, are, are, are shared and engage and then inform the discussions going forward. What is the global stock take? So this is essentially a process through which we assess the climate response plans announced by countries through the UNFCCC process. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, that threw me completely. So what is the global stock take? It's, uh, it's a process through which we look at the climate change plans that have been announced by countries around the world, specifically their NDCs, nationally determined contributions, which is the document through which countries basically through this UN process explain what they're planning to do on climate change. Look at all those plans. You look at what the scientists through the, through the IPCC are telling us what needs to be done to prevent the worst of climate change or meet the Paris Agreement goals of 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And the global stock tech tells you, well, if we implement those plans, are we going to get to where we need to be? And well, maybe the reason why I didn't spend too much time on it is that I think it's generally understood. And even what we've seen from the global stock tech so far, it's very clear that uh, the plans are not sufficient, uh, that we are going to need more ambitious commitments uh, across mitigation, adaptation, and we also need action on loss and damage. So that's basically what, what the global stock take is and why it's important. It is important because you do need an institutionalized process uh, which, which, which has strong kind of scientific fundamentals, shall we say, uh, that clearly communicate, are we on track? But the answer is that we're not on track. And that means that 
it just adds further pressure on on having an ambitious commitment. I see. Between a zombie apocalypse and Bobita, bring me in with. Can we maybe uh, remove that person from the group? We've had two interruptions now. Papa, you can look into that for me, please. We should have the ability to remove yeah, well, participants. Okay. Uh, I see a hand from uh, Yemi. Excuse me. Uh, good morning, and thanks, uh, Alex, uh, for for that briefing. You know, as you were talking and as you touched on the the issue of mitigation, um, I was curious as to your uh, reflections on the issue of um, uh, carbon markets and carbon credit, uh, credits, because this has become a massive thing for the Africans. They're all rushing. Um, and I know that there's a there's a company called Blue Carbon that has been going around si signing MOUs. They have an MOU with Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Zambia, I think Kenya. I think almost like 28 million hectares, you know, in total that they're signing. Um, this is then being presented, you know, that this is the way we're going to get climate finance. You know, we'll get the money that we need in order to undertake sustainable forest management and those kinds of issues. But we don't seem to have an agreed definition of what exactly is climate finance. And is this the way we are going to achieve climate finance, uh, you know, going this route? But also the over-reliance on the forest as the solution. And then comes back to the points that you're making on the global stock take and the, the NDCs. So when you look at the some of the work being done by the land gap, they're finding that when you add up all the solutions in these NDCs, they're coming up to about 1.2 billion hectares of land that will be needed land is not there so you know that this thing is not realistic so perhaps you know to hear from you and i mean the other thing we we, we don't seem to talk about are the non-market mechanisms uh in particular um uh, 6.8 article 6.8 um because you're saying yes uh, we need to mobilize domestic resources but we also need to continuously remind uh the the developed countries um, to make these resources available and not just the volume of the resources, but also how they are being made available. I mean, are these grants, are these commercial loans, are these uh, uh, concessionary loans and the debt crisis that we see most of the Africa. I mean, you look at what is happening in Zambia, what is happening in Ghana, it's massive, massive uh, uh, debt issues there. Uh, Zimbabwe, where I'm from, we owe uh, over 20 billion now. Will, uh, you know, will we ever be able to pay that back? So these things seem to be very, you know, they're all kind of linked. Um, so you know, when we talk about uh, mitigation, there are all these other things that are linked to all these uh, these other mechanisms. So it'd be good to hear, you know, whether you guys have been looking at some of these issues and whether going into COP28, we are seeing the oil producers by signing these deals with African countries uh, for large tracts of forest land, whether they, they want to now move towards uh, an agreement for um, um, getting, getting these, these forests uh, that are standing protected forests to offset the, the the increased oil production. So thanks. Yeah, let me jump straight into that without taking another question because there's quite a bit to cover there. Um, carbon markets are controversial. There's no way of getting around that. And it feeds into that, that theme that I addressed right at the beginning in terms of that relationship between uh, developments and uh, climate change. Um, it has been presented by some within that framework of this is the big polluters, uh, the big polluting companies and the big polluting countries um, essentially paying uh, them, their way out of the problem. 
pay, at, at its at its at its most extreme kind of caricature level, kind of paying Africa and other poor regions to stay poor by not touching their land, not developing forested areas, and so forth. Um, yes, so I'm aware of that controversy. There's a lot of debate also around measurements um, and what actually happens with these forests when carbon credits are, are paid for them. It is important to note that carbon markets are not just around forests. Uh, it's true that it started there and that to an extent still dominates some of the discussion around carbon markets. But myself working in the oceans climate space, there's a lot of discussion around uh, carbon markets uh, in coastal and marine environments. Mangroves is, a, is an easy example, but also, for example, uh, salt marshes and other vegetated ecosystems. And also growing work in terms of um, other ecosystems um, and, uh, and, and, you know, basically, shall we say, not just tropical forests, because we tend to think Amazon, we tend to think, um, you know, Congo uh, forest, but other, other areas. So that's one point. Um, I mean, it is true. Um, this point was, was made actually this weekend at a conference I was attending is that if you look, if you if you take the idea of um, nature-based solutions and uh, the need for um, bio or thinking about biodiversity as a carbon sink, absorbing that carbon, then the reality is that largely the biodiversity richness, those ecosystems are largely in the global south, but the capital is in the global north. Um, at the same time, a lot of the the people and the solutions and the in, in, innovation and the way the population growth is happening is also in the global south. But again, the capital is in the global north. So in that respect, carbon markets represents one means through which some of that capital can be channel, channeled to the global south. Um, so that's why, I mean, we're, we're aware of the controversies and challenges, I myself am, am hesitant to kind of dismiss carbon markets. There have been there have been problems around the implementation and framing of carbon markets. And I think you touch on some of these issues around, you know, tracts of land, forests. Um, there is real potential for for um, the marginalization of of vulnerable groups. Uh, the reality is that African communities are, are highly reliant on the natural resources found in forests and other ecosystems. Um, and that there's always been a system of, of, of shall we say, socio-ecological systems. So we're not thinking about nature as something separate from society that we can put a fence around and protect, but recognize that social systems and communities are deeply integrated with these ecosystems we're talking about, whether they're tropical forests or woodland systems or uh, coastal mangroves and so forth. And, and, and that's why when we talk about um, carbon market transactions, uh, we need to be very cautious around inclusivity livelihoods, uh, cons consultation, and so forth. So if it's going to be a case of, uh, you know, foreign money coming in to buy up African land that is actually being used for small-scale agriculture, but instead of that, pushing those farmers off and planting a million trees that, that don't actually have all that much economic value, that's obviously problematic. Um, you know, we need to be thinking very carefully about the impacts on livelihoods, food security, and so forth. I'm not quite ready to kind of dismiss it. I do think that we need to look at carbon markets as part of the solution, recognizing that that there are um, kind of procedural uncertainties and, and conceptual things that need to be addressed. There is potential for abuse, and therefore we need um, very close monitoring and tracking of these of these systems. We need further work on establishing those. 
Uh, I do think one of the th one of the messages that came out of the out of the um, Nairobi Declaration was, I think, a, a level of of of, of um, certainly interest from from African policymakers in further developing carbon markets. So, um, yes, and then the debt angle. So even if you look at South Africa's Just Energy Transition Partnership, um, in fact, if you look at the Just Energy Transition uh, Investment Plan, the JET IP, uh, in Chapter 6, uh, I don't have those stats with me now, but it actually gives us a breakdown of what portion of uh, the billions of dollars that was promised to South Africa under the investment of under the uh, partnership, uh, how much of that is debt and grants and you know the different makeup? And in fact, grants is a very small share of it, and a big share of it is debt. So yes, we know that um, debt and debt sustainability is a, a big concern, um, and it's something that again needs to be looked at very closely. Um, Again, it's it's hard to it's hard to draw a clear line on this because the reality is that grants are simply not going to ever be able to be implemented at the scale that, that that's required. This you're going to have to need a kind of a, a portfolio approach, a number of different solutions. Um, and grants are going to be part of that. And obviously, where grants that that don't contribute to debt problems, you know, can be scaled up. We should be continuing to push for that. But but I don't think grants are going to be the totality of the solution. And therefore, thinking about debt carefully um, and negotiating hard in terms of the, the debt repayments and uh, interest rates in these areas is going to need to be part of the discussion. But countries do need to be very careful that they don't dig themselves into a hole that they can't get out of when it comes to building debt. Uh, then, of course, tied to this, but separate from, I think, the way you phrased the question, is this very interesting area of debt for climate swaps. And Seychelles, of course, is a very interesting example there, but there are other countries that are exploring this. So this is where countries have debt that wasn't built up as a result of climate change. It could be any form of, of, of national debt. Um, and then an agreement is made by the country that's owing the debt to its uh, to the countries that it needs to make those repayments to. That rather than repaying those debt directly to those countries, the debt gets paid into a fund, and that fund gets used to actually build up and improve uh, ecosystems and even socioeconomic initiatives that contribute to environmental protection, contribute to advanced climate change adaptation and resilience. Uh, and this is something that Seychelles has done quite successfully. And as I said, other countries are exploring. So uh, also also an area that's, that's very dynamic and generating a lot of interest. Are there other, other hands? Madeleine? Hey, yes, um, I wanted to ask, considering South Africa's global and regional role, um, how powerful is it in the fight for climate justice and how well does it advocate for other African countries? And in which way do you think Africans can create more climate justice through global forums like the COP? And do you think that, or like how are other actors like the EU and BRICS states, for example, supporting or sabotaging these ideas and efforts? Thank you. Yeah, again, let me jump in. And then I think after this one, I'm also just going to ask my colleagues if they want to jump in on these questions or anything else that they thought to say. Um, South Africa has, has for a very long time played a, a very powerful role in the global climate negotiations. Um, and But I would also say that South Africa has all along insisted uh, on aligning itself and supporting its engagements within the broader Africa group. So Africa has the Africa Group of Negotiators, AGN. 
a lot of the negotiations in the climate change, for, for those of you who might not be aware of it, actually takes place as negotiating blocks. And you have a number of these of these uh, blocks that engage where they try and align themselves. They have shared interests and try and push an agenda through working together. So you have small island developing states that face a lot of the same challenges and that have pushed certain agenda points within the negotiations. And, and the entire Africa comes together through the uh, Africa group of negotiators and tries to elevate its messaging through working together in that way. And South Africa um, has played an important role there. Um, also because South Africa, if you look across the continent, um, South Africa has relatively strong um, technical and diplomatic depth to support engagement in climate negotiations, uh, relatively large delegation, a lot of support through uh, universities and, and, and government uh, research institutions and so forth. So they're able to engage on a number of, of agenda items within the negotiations, uh, often to a, to a greater extent that less well-resourced uh, African nations can do. So in that respect, also South Africa has a very important role if you look at the region. That's not to say that South Africa has some sort of special privilege to speak on behalf of Africa. And I do think that South Africa's and South Africa's delegation spokespeople have been quite sensitive to that. But uh, yes, there is capacity there. Um, and and I think they've done a, a, a very good job of, of, of amplifying and aligning themselves with a broader Africa negotiating position. Um, what is that negotiating position? Again, the, the climate change strategy and the Nairobi Declaration gives you some sense of that. Um, there's always been a very strong emphasis on the importance of adaptation so that the global climate negotiations don't just focus on mitigation, but also focus on adaptation, which is a priority area for the Africa region as a whole. Um, and the finance question, uh, as I said, initially, just the message of there needs to be more finance support um, for developing regions, and it needs to be more accessible. Uh, that remains important. But as I said, increasingly now, and what we saw at the Africa Climate Summit, positioning those calls within a larger effort to actually reform the system, so for systemic change to take place. Um, then South Africa also has a role in, in, in other groups. So we have the, the basic group, um, uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China, which play a very important role. Um, and then I guess probably the largest group is, is G77 plus China, which is largely kind of pretty much all developing countries. Um, and South Africa plays an important role in those groups as well. Um, and even in those groups, um, seeks to draw from and align from its positioning as part of, of the Africa group um, within those negotiations. So I think in brief, South Africa does play a very big role, continues to play a big role. Um, and I think it's important that that that's, that, that continues. Um, let me quickly ask now my colleagues, Romy, um, uh, the youth team, uh, really, this is an open invitation to any of my colleagues to jump in quickly. Uh, Papa, you can just help me quickly. Is our meeting going to be cut off strictly at 11 or would we be able to go a few minutes over if we have to? You can go as long as you like. <laughs> okay, well, we won't go all morning, but we might go a few minutes over. Romy? Perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the SIA team today to discuss COP28. Um, uh, Alex, you've done a good job of basically discussing quite a quite a few things. So I'll just maybe touch on a, a few extra or pointers. So the last question that was raised about South Africa, um, I completely agree with you. Uh, South Africa obviously has a different mitigation profile to the to the rest of the continent, which. Um, like a few of its colleagues, it has to really be a lot more ambitious in terms of what it commits to in terms of reducing uh, carbon dioxide because it's the, the continent's largest uh, global carbon emission uh, emitter. Um, 
but clearly it has a lot of um, difficulties around the just energy transition conversations that Alex has mentioned already. So if we look at the role that it's playing at the G77 in China, which is this very, very big block of developing countries, um, South Africa plays a very strong role there at that forum, uh, representing the just energy transition issues. So, um, what just in what just energy transitions look like? So it obviously looks at its own model, and other countries look at at the South African model model as well. But it looks at um, how, what financial resources are needed in order to to help uh, countries like South Africa and others transition to a low carbon, uh, climate resilient future. We haven't spoken about the global goal of ad on adaptation, which will be something that is looked at quite closely at uh, the COP. And South Africa is very, um, uh, very, so A, it wants to see uh, adaptation a lot more visible, so on par with mitigation. It consistently asks uh, for visibility that's given to adaptation and loss and damage for those most vulnerable and obviously trying to cope with the impacts of climate change. Um, and then obviously uh, request the, uh, the requisite kind of support for, for countries that, that need to move. And if we look at just some of the dynamics quickly on the global, uh, the global goal for adaptation is that there's been a lot of uh, emphasis to date on ensuring that we have a quantifiable targets and indicators for adaptation. So, so obviously uh, mitigation is easier to measure, but at the moment we have nothing to measure adaptation by and nothing to monitor uh, the, the progress made. So there's a lot of conversation around putting targets and, and indicators on the table and South Africa has made suggestions as to what that might look like and um, very specifically looking at climate resilience for, for, uh, for the global population. Um, I think that's important. And then, um, Alex, you've mentioned already, but South Africa is very vocal on global financial reform. So consistently calling for the big multilateral development banks, the Bretton Woods institutions to reform um, towards these new, this new suite of financing instruments that, as we've mentioned, the not, uh, you know, non-debt uh, kind of uh, enhancing uh, with favorable conditions for the developing countries. Um, yeah, so I think that's important to note. And then just on the global stock take, I think there was a, a question about that, but you've mentioned most things. Um, the one thing maybe from a, from a media perspective to, to note is that there has the assessment report for the global uh, stock take has already come out. It came out in September, which gives us the initial findings to show us how basically where we're at in terms of the progress made. Um, and it clearly shows that we're not, we, we haven't met the, the level of ambition and the scale that, that is needed. Um, which therefore has a huge impact on on the ability of countries to cope with the impacts of climate change. So, so I can say I'll put that link in the in the chat if it's interesting for you. But just have a look. Um, and South Africa again is playing a lead role in the, those conversations around the global stock take. But what's also interesting from an Africa perspective, I think this is an opportunity or a milestone where we can kind of reflect. It's a it's an accountability tool in a way to say this is where we are at. So I think there's a lot of advocacy that we'll see around the results of the global stock take and what that means for, for action going forward. And it's not only about countries and the NDCs, it's also looking at the non-state actors. So who's been doing what in terms of ambition? So there's going to be a focus, I think, a lot more on private sector, um, the big kind of oil, you know, oil and energy companies as, in, as large emitters, um, as well as the progress being made by many non-state actors. So cities, um, anyway, there's many, many actors. Um, Okay, let me stop there and then see where there's interest. Perfect, thanks, Alex. Yeah, uh, we are kind of running up against our, our time slot here. I do want to check in with uh, if there are any participants from size other research programs, um, youth or economic diplomacy, uh, you're welcome to jump in. Um, I'll just remind everyone the, 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 the title that I was looking for was the South African Youth Climate Action Plan. SAYCAP, and I see the link is in the chat. I really do encourage you uh, to all engage with that. Uh, Alwanda, would you like to come on? For sure. Thanks so much. Perfect entrance. Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Alwanda Kumalo, Youth Programs Officer. Um, yeah, so the document that Alex was basically speaking of is the South African Youth Climate Action Plan. Uh, abbreviated by SAYCAP, and essentially it's a living vision document that is consistently um, updated by young people from and living in South Africa. It stands as two essential things. The first one is a call to national stakeholders to honor their climate pledges. And the second one um, is a framework to inspire youth-led climate action for just, sustainable and prosperous and resilient society. 
Um, so that basically serves as a really key anchor for all of the um, climate justice work and climate action work that our young people do. Um, and yes, as Alex mentioned, mentioned in the beginning of the media briefing, we have three young people who are attending as party delegates at COP, so we're super excited about that, and they will definitely bring in the work of the SAY cap and um, all the various buildings from that. But if you have any other questions, queries, if you'd like to be a part of Youth of Sire, please just contact us and the email address just provided in the chat room. Thanks so much. Fantastic, I wonder that was great. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to ask for any further questions um, because then we really are going to start running over time. But again, just a final uh, opportunity for any of my colleagues who want to jump in. And then while we wait to see if, if hands come up, um, I've also just quickly scanned through um, the links. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to say, see that as I've been calling for them, they, they've been going up very nicely. So thank you to my colleagues for, for doing that on the run. Um, but there's really, there are fantastic resources there, uh, both SIA resources and external resources. Um, so I really do encourage our, our participants here today to scan through those, do a, a few quick um, opening up those links or copy and paste or, or whatever the case may be. Um, Right, I guess we're we're two minutes over, um, and I think it might might be good to close. Of course, these discussions could could certainly go on all day or all week. Um, I would also say if there are anyone, uh, if there is anyone here who is actually going to COP twenty eight, um, or have colleagues who are going to go to COP28. Sayo will be at COP28. Uh, Romy will be there for the for the first part. Uh, our colleague uh, Joseph as well from our economic diplomacy program. And I'll be at COP28 from about the 5th uh, of December, so for the second part. Um, and please reach out to us um, and we could always take the conversation further there. All right, and with that, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you again um, for my colleagues helping on the content side and on the technical front. Apologies for that very weird disruption we had, not sure what happened there. Um, and um, again, thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us today.